Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event showcasing The Weekly, The Times' new weekly TV series premiering on FX on Sunday nights and streaming on Hulu and already earning rave reviews. Quote, just three episodes in, wrote Pointer, a leading voice in journalism, and The Weekly has already established itself as one of the best news shows in television. Tonight, we're pleased to present an advanced episode uh, or an advanced screening of an upcoming episode of The Weekly. In this episode, titled The End of the Line, New York Times national correspondent Sabrina Tavernese explores the personal impact of technological shifts on workers at a GM auto plant in Lordstown, Ohio. Following the screening, New York Times Magazine editor Jake Silverstein will moderate a, a panel featuring Sabrina, along with Times assistant managing editor Sam Dulnick, an executive producer of The Weekly, and Caitlin Dickerson, a New York Times national immigration reporter. Caitlin was featured on last night's episode of The Weekly, which followed her as she uncovered the untold story of baby Constantine, the youngest child taken from his parents at the US-Mexico border under the Trump administration's zero tolerance border policy. Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? Did you enjoy the episode? Mm. Enjoy, enjoy might be the wrong word, but mm. I found it, I hope, engrossing and stimulating. And, and we're going to start uh, with that, that episode and talk a little bit about it with Sabrina Tavernisi here. We also have Elise Shoreland here, who is the producer director of that episode. Where's Elise? Stand up. Stand up so the people can see you. So. Many of the questions that I'm going to ask Sabrina, Elise could also answer, and perhaps she'll uh, join in. Maybe later when we have Q&A, there'll be a chance for Q&A uh, at the end of, of about half an hour of us just chatting about this episode, um, the episode that was on the air last night that uh, was uh, featuring one of Caitlin's great stories. I hope some of you saw it. We'll see a few short clips of it. Um, but Sabrina, I want to start with you. So, for these people, you know, they've just come out of getting to know all the folks from Lordstown. I wonder if, can you just update us? What, what is happening now in Lordstown? Some people have transferred. Some people are, there's a sort of possibility that another company was going to occupy the plan. That seems to have not worked out. What, what is the current status of what's going to happen in Lordstown? So um, Lordstown is much as you saw it in the film uh, still. Uh, the uh, fate of the plant rests on union negotiations with GM, which will begin in July. And uh, Rick is still, you know, essentially kind of jobless on unemployment, waiting to see uh, whether he might actually have a job at the end of all of this. Um, and, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's very, very, very stressful for the families. Um, it was thousands of people um, in the very beginning when, uh, uh, actually, um, I don't know, some of the, the workers were reading a little bit conspiracy theory into the timing of things, but literally the day after Trump's election, GM announced the first round of layoffs at this plant. Mm. Um, so in January of 2017, uh, sorry, uh, November 9th, 2016, uh, there was a, the, they announced that the third shift would be cut. So that's basically a crew of about 1,500 people who work uh, late nights. Uh, and in the total number of workers, the shift was about 5,000 people. Um, and so it had dwindled to about 1,500. Um, the time Elise and I were there, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a much smaller group. Um, and, you know, they, um, I guess in some ways, if you think broadly about the American economy, are kind of lucky, you know, that the GM uh, contractually is obligated uh, for many of them that have a lot of seniority to transfer them to other plants. Um, some of them went to plants in Flint, Michigan. Um, there was um, a plant in Wentzville, Missouri that many were going to, some to Texas, some to Spring Hill, Tennessee. Uh, although that's a part of kind of Tennessee that was quite expensive housewise. So many of them were saying they couldn't afford to live 
Uh, they couldn't afford to buy houses there. Um, right. And many of them were just commuting. So they would go, you know, drive eight hours, work the week, and then, you know, once, or, once, once every month or so, come back and see their families. And we heard many of them talk about how they felt this wasn't fair. We heard Dave Green, the president of the local UAW chapter, talking about, you know, the, the, the injustice of it, essentially, these people who have given their lives and done everything right. Who, who is it that they blame? I mean, you, you mentioned the sort of political valence of this, and yes. this, the first layoffs <laughs> happening the day after Trump's inauguration. But is there a politician that, that you tended to hear people blaming for what's happening? Was it Mary Barra that people tended to blame? Was it capitalism? Was it globalization? Was it you know, cheap labor in Mexico? What was the sort of the thing that people tended to blame? So I, you know, I, um, one of the curiosities I had about Lordstown was this was a, you know, this was a, a, a place that uh, for decades had voted for Democrats. Uh, it hadn't voted for Republican for president since 1972. Uh, and it had voted overwhelmingly for Trump. And um, so, you know, I was curious. Here was this, this thing happening uh, that was very much kind of, you know, against what people were hoping and expecting. Um, Trump had come out in a campaign rally and said, you know, don't sell your houses. These jobs are coming back, folks. As, oh, as you saw, I guess you saw the clip. Yeah, never mind. Um, and, um, <laughs> And you know, and 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 so I expected. Oh, you know, I'm going to find a lot of people who are really mad at this president, um, and I didn't find that. You know, I found some. This is also a you know a part of the country where people voted for Obama overwhelmingly. The, the auto industry, as you saw, um, I don't know if you remember that. You know, in 2008, GM almost went bankrupt. And uh, Obama had to make the hard decision of whether to bail it out, uh, and he did. And all of those workers, or at least you know, the overwhelming majority of the workers I talked to really gave him credit for that. Uh, but at the same time, they said, you know, they, were, they felt very, very frustrated, I think, by the political class more broadly. They didn't really feel that they were sort of um, some sort of, they didn't feel really team red or team blue either way. Uh, they didn't feel partisan. It was more just this broad just frustration and almost disgust at the political class that, you know, you know, back in the day we voted Democrat, yes, but you know, guess what? You know, who who were the people who signed NAFTA? That was the Clinton administration. Um, you know, we feel like all of this, all of you know, so much of our world has gone to Mexico. So much um, has been lost in trade, and you know, the Republicans may have started, but the Democrats were the ones that really signed on the dotted line with that. So they felt kind of, in some ways, I think, you know, um, that that voting for Obama. I mean, I, th I think I think that voting for Obama and voting for Trump, in some ways, for them was sort of similar because they were both guys they thought okay these are just these are change guys and this is like a hail mary pass and we're going to go for it and like they went for it with obama and you know it worked to the extent that like their company wasn't dead but you know generally you know the life in northeast ohio kind of continued to lump yeah right. i mean the the point that their what the, aver the income average income of the workers of the yeah so trumbull county very double very, the median income for the county yeah so these workers have you know really they were they're making double what um, the average worker in trumbull county is making so trumbull county right. very very you know low um, uh, median wage and they're Trumbull. seeing obviously what's happening at some of the the area, other area plants and industry and et cetera. So is what Mary Barra had to say, I mean, one of the things that was so interesting about this episode is how it's able to contain all these different viewpoints about this issue, you know, from the workers on the line to the CEO of the company. And is, do you have the sense that any of what Mary Barra was saying to you is persuasive to the workers on the line and to Dave Green? Oh, <laughs> not so much. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't think that they really had the view that, oh, she's in a tough position, which she is. Um, they had the view that, well, I think it's pretty damn unfair that I have to pick up my family and move to Wentzville, Missouri in 10 days, or I lose this job. Um, but, you know, if you think of it from her perspective, um, this is a really hard problem. Um, they're trying to kind of vault themselves into this future that they don't even know really what it's going to be. And you know, it's not that we, you know, we shouldn't really be skeptical that maybe they would uh, not make it because in 2008 that was a, you know, that was something right. that was right in front of us. Right. Um, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about about the episode, but Sam, I want to go to you and just take a big step back here. So, we just got our first look at this episode. Uh, there have been three episodes of this new show, The Weekly, that have aired so far. Caitlin's the most recent last night. 
about baby Constantine. We'll see a little clip in a minute. Um, why, what's, what, tell us about the road to getting into television. Why is the Times getting into sh television? Why is now the right time for, for the Times to be on, on TV? Yeah, why did we do all this? Yeah, exactly. Um, and how did it all happen? Yeah, so we've got this giant newsroom, 1,600 people, reporters like Caitlin and Sabrina and Katrin Benholt in Berlin and Rukmini Kalamaki investigating ISIS. All of these reporters with this kind of singular knowledge and for a long time, we only had one way to tell people about what they found. And that was through the institutional voice of a newspaper article in a real kind of authoritative tone. And digital media, but the past couple of years, the cultural changes at the Times has allowed us to, to shift that. And so it started with audio. A couple of years ago, we didn't have an audio department. And then we decided we should. And now we have The Daily, which is our daily podcast that these two are regulars on and feels to us like the modern front page of The New York Times. But more importantly, it's, in, it's a whole new language. It's a way that these reporters can go back into the world and find out things and come back and explain it in their own voice as themselves. I think part of the reason people have connected to it so much is because Sabrina is a person who's been on a journey and is going to come back. And she spent weeks in Baltimore. And she's going to tell you what she found. And it's not laundered through the institutional voice. It's in Sabrina's voice. So after we, we were so excited about audio that kind of felt natural, what about TV? There's so many places. Sabrina's been in Baltimore for four weeks. She can't show it to you on the daily. Well, let's show people what it's like. And so we started playing around with the idea of a TV show and started piloting it and started sending talented producers like Elise and others out in the field with these folks. And we found a new visual language that we think captures the ambition and the rigor of the times, but adds a whole new dimension to the kind of stories we want to tell. You mentioned The Daily is, in some ways, almost a precursor to this. Yeah. Obviously, that's called The Daily, and this is called The Weekly. What's, what's The Monthly? Is that like an opera that we do <laughs> once, a, once a month? Come um, back next month, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so you know, obviously, there's a relationship there. And I want to ask the two of you, as Sam mentioned, both of you have, have been stars on The Daily many times. Um, what, what, is the, the, what are some of the lessons? I mean, Caitlin, you have a background in, in, in radio. Um, but what are some of the lessons that you took or have taken from showing up on the daily and kind of hearing how your reporting gets turned around and create, turned into something different than what you might have created if you were just sitting down to write by yourself? Um, what are some of the lessons that you took from that experience and that you also sort of see at work in, in this experience of working for TV? Let's start with you, Caitlin. I think that when I learned to write for broadcast, the general message was to write a lot more like the way that I would describe my reporting if I was talking to somebody at the dinner table or to my friend at a bar. So I think that I think the writing is a lot more conversational and it sounds a lot more like I was, you know, sitting in front of one of you guys and just telling you what I found when I went out reporting as opposed to like Sam described sort of going back to my desk synthesizing all of it, deciding what I thought that it meant, and then writing it in this formal print style. And then there's also, we were talking about this a little bit backstage, but the sort of moment of reckoning in an interview that happens a lot more mm. in both radio and in video, which I really like doing because I, I came up as a, an investigative radio reporter. So the big interview, the most important piece of your story was the interview of Reckoning where you went to the subject, the person who'd sort of, or the, or the federal agency or who, whatever it was that had, had done something wrong and you, you literally sit down with them and you ask them, you know, why did you do this? And you play the role of your audience member and that's a really satisfying conversation to mm. have and again, you know, to be able to just see it play out in real time rather than synthesizing it, I think is more powerful because sometimes, of course, they don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a really long pregnant pause or sometimes they gasp or sometimes they, you know, shudder and you can see that they're nervous and you've caught them off guard. And, and that's really satisfying because I'm getting to sort of play the role of the audience member, be you guys. So do you, do you, ha do you have the experience when you do something for The Daily or when you did the Baby Constantine episode that things that are, you're not able to get into the print story, you're able to now express through the sounds of the subjects or what they look like. And is that, is that 
Do you have that experience? Absolutely, okay. and there's so much texture that you can add with video. I mean, my story, you'll see, it's about the youngest child who was separated at the border by the Trump administration, a four-month-old baby. And I can say that to you guys, and I can write it down, but to see the baby and to see the footage that was captured of him by the foster mother who cared for him for five months with, when he lived in Michigan, I think is yeah. just, it, you can't do that any other way. Should we show it? Uh, well, well, we'll get to it in one second. I want to ask you, Sabrina, um, is it, the, we were talking backstage about how there's a certain way that you approach somebody, a subject, when you're interviewing them for a print story, and <laughs> when you're not going to see any of that approach. And then it's right. a little different when the whole approach is being documented by a film crew that's following you around and <laughs> seeing everything you do to, to interview your subject. What, what is the major difference? I mean, it seems like it's very, very different to... It's very different, and I think you know anybody who's ever done print reporting. Um, usually, people you interview, they leave the interview thinking that you really, really like them. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, so smart. oh, wonderful, wonderful, thank you so much. You know, you have this whole, and like you know, you're gonna go back and kind of sort through things in your mind at your desk and make up your mind. But you know, you're trying to kind of get them to be as. Uh, kind of, you know, informing and direct and comfortable with you as possible so that you can have the best story possible. So, you know, that's who I was in my life for a long time. And I think to a certain extent with the daily and the audio, but to a large extent with the weekly, I uh, realized, oh, I can't actually do that in an interview. And, and the case in point I was telling Jake about was, um, you know, the Mary Barra interview, which we were very excited about and, you know, we really wanted to kind of you know, do it well, and we really wanted it to be a big piece of, of, of the, the documentary. And, uh, and I went in, and I had my kind of print hat on, and I said, oh, you know, thank you so much. And I was kind of very effusive, and I, I'm sort of effusive naturally anyway. But, but um, she, I realized with a panic sort of halfway through this 45-minute interview we had that all we had was footage of me being effusive. And I thought, oh, shit. wow, I need to bang my fist on the table and say, like, yeah, yeah <laughs> we need answers, you know? And I, I realized that I was, maybe I needed to be different. Well, that's interesting because <laughs> it, it suggests that there, I mean, part of what this show is about, uh, and actually, I'm going to put this as a question. Is this show about the stories? Well, obviously, it's about the stories. To what extent is it also about the practice of journalism? That's a question for all three of you. For me, it's about the stories. You know, <clears throat> watching Caitlin's episode, it's about Trump's policy and about it's a reminder that immigration politics isn't just a, a scorecard or a football to bat back and forth. These are real people who are caught up in this. And from the very first frame of, of, of that film, you remember that these are children who are who are caught up in the policy. So for me, that's what that episode is about. Dogged reporting, Caitlin found the youngest child. Caitlin broke many stories about the, chi the child separation beat. And hopefully the episode conveys that, because I think mm -hmm. that's part of the story. But I hope you walk away with that, you know, with real questions about our immigration policy. And similarly here in this episode, there, I think this raises profound questions about what is fair in, in capitalism, but what's the future of the auto worker, and is there a future, and what do we owe these workers? That's what I think these episodes are about. But I think they're all girded by journalistic rigor, and mm -hmm. I hope people see the lengths that these reporters go to to get the story, and the lengths they go to get them right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with Sam, and I think one thing that's occurring to me right now, a difference we might be experiencing when we go out and report stories for video versus for print is that if I want to make a subject come alive in print, I need to go to great, great lengths and be effusive to make them feel comfortable because I need as many literal words as I can get to paint a picture with a quotation of who they are. With broadcast, words, like jumbled, really, really dense answers are do nothing. <laughs> it's, it's the facial expression. It's the sort of energy between the two of you. And so I don't think that makes this film a documentary about the reporter. I think that that's just, it's a better way of right. communicating in a visual medium what's happening. But it is true that you, I, th I mean, I think for you guys are reporters. So you go out and you do your thing and it's just what you've always done. But for a reader who is now a viewer, the term for what we are keeps changing. Hmm. Um, 
for a reader who's now a viewer, they watch, like, for instance, that scene at the end where you're interviewing, um, sorry, what's his name? Dave Green? No, no, the... Um, Rick Marsh. Rick. Yeah. When you're interviewing Rick and you're in his house and you're sitting on the couch, and it's clear that over time you've developed a rapport with him. And I, I, I do think that there's an interesting way in which a viewer starts to understand that there's this whole other thing that journalists do aside from just going out and asking questions. And people aren't going to answer your questions unless you've built up some kind of trust with them. And you see that in that... And that's, you also see it in the way that you interact with the family, the parents of, of baby Constantine. I mean, how much, is that something that you feel a little, a little weird about having, you know, all the very many viewers of FX and Hulu take? No, I was happy. In fact, my own editor said, oh, wow, you uh -huh. sit down on the couch and talk to him for a long right, time. I right, said, yeah. Right. And I love that, you know, Sabrina Tavernisi, it's just a gray byline to everybody. Most people don't even read right. the bylines. But that scene with her feet up on the couch, she's a real human. Right, right. Really connecting with this person, trying to understand them. When you see that, I think it's really hard to dismiss what Sabrina or what anybody in journalism at the Times does as, as fake news. Uh, I was wondering when we were going to get to the term fake news. <laughs> so is this show kind of like an antidote to the claim of fake news? I, I don't know if that's what it's intended to do, but I hope that's what it does. Yeah, I think that if you watch this week after week and you see you know, Maggie Haberman in Washington and Rukmini in Europe and Mike Isaac in Silicon Valley and just all of these reporters week after week trying to find something out, trying to answer hard questions, yeah, I hope so. Well, let's let's take a look at the very beginning of, of your episode, Caitlin. So I, I assume some of you, I hope some of you saw this last night. We won't be able to watch the whole episode. We'll watch uh, just the very beginning, and then we chat. We can chat a little bit about that, and then we have another clip from later. So this is the very beginning of the Baby Constantine episode. Ne gândeam la un trai fericit. Nu năcăjit. Nici până în cap nu mi-a trecut ca să întâmplă. Că ne, ne bagă pe acolo să-mi ia și copilul și bărbat. This is Constantin Mutu. Five months of his life were documented through these images. At just four months old, he was taken from his father at the United States border making him the youngest child to be separated by the Trump administration. But there were thousands of children separated like him. Hi, thanks for calling back. My name is Caitlin Dickerson. I'm a national immigration reporter for The New York Times. And you need that to give credence to the report, right? Constantine's separation took place at the same time I was reporting on family separations at the U.S. border. I'm going to tell you how my reporting helped to uncover one of the Trump administration's most contentious policies and how that policy altered one infant's life. So, so Kaylin, you, you, you've written and reported a ton about this subject. You broke, I don't, you've broken, I don't know how many stories. You really own this beat. You've, you've revealed so much about what the administration has been doing at the border. Um, you've just been dogged on this story for a long time now. Why, of all the different stories that you could have told through this incredible medium of the weekly, why choose baby Constantine? I mean, as, as I said, there's, there's many different family separation uh, or just more broadly immigration stories that you, you might have chosen to tell. Why did you feel like this one made, a, made such a great fit for TV? You know, I think the first and most obvious reason is because he's a baby and <laughs> it's shocking and striking. And I know when I was looking through federal court records covering the federal lawsuit that prompted family reunifications, when I saw a line that said a four, mentioned a four month old baby whose father had been deported without him, I stopped in my tracks and sort of gasped. That's and how you found this story? That's how I found this story and, and immediately thought, he's got to be the youngest. I was already interested in babies. I knew that there were some babies and, and wanted to figure out a way to cover them. And that was by far the youngest age I'd ever heard. It turned out he was, in fact, the youngest. So that's sort of, you know, the sort of shock of it is, is the first and most obvious reason. But I think, too, bigger than that, as you pointed out, I wrote and my colleagues wrote so many stories about family separation. And the challenge with immigration in general is that Stories start to get muddled, I think, mm -hmm. in people's minds. 
and they get sort of overloaded. There's so much happening on immigration right now. The president is, is really into this topic, if you guys have noticed. And, and so much is changing really quickly that it becomes, it raises the bar for my colleagues and I to choose stories that are going to really stick in people's mind, where, where details are going to stick in people's minds as opposed to sort of divisive political language. And I just felt like not only Constantine, but once I got to know his family, the foster family who took care of him, the caseworker who took care of them, they all had such interesting perspectives that I felt like I could tell the whole story in a really memorable way through them. So uh, we don't have enough time for you to tell the whole story right here. If you haven't seen this episode, you really have to go watch it. You can watch it on Hulu. Um, am I supposed to say that? Good one, yeah. OK, good. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very moving episode. But just give us kind of the nutshell. So. <laughs> Baby Constantine's four months old. He's separated from his parents at the U.S.-Mexico border. Mm -hmm. And what happens next? So just to take a couple steps back, you notice that you may have noticed that he's not Central American, even though the vast majority of people who were separated from their children were. Constantine is from Romania. And for years, the United States has had a steady flow of people who, like him, are Roma. They're part of a persecuted ethnic minority. They've been turned away from the hospitals for treatment. This family, their kids have been harassed in school. Um, most horrifically, his mother says that she was sterilized against her will after she had Constantine, her fifth child. And so his parents decided they were going to try to seek asylum in the United States. They knew other Roma families who'd done the same. They had no idea, of course, what was going on in the United States at the time. This was February 2018, months before the administration would acknowledge family separations publicly. They paid somebody to get them with their two youngest kids to Mexico and presented themselves at a legal port of entry, handed over their passports, requested asylum, and what instead happened was that Constantine was taken from his father, contract workers shipped him to Michigan, where he was delivered. Wait, stop right there. Contract workers? How yes. So is this, this is true for babies, but also for toddlers. And mm -hmm. when they are taken from their parents, they're literally just handed over to contract workers? It's kind of amazing to think about two adults bringing this four-month-old baby who'd been breastfeeding. So, you know, he's fussing. They don't have anything to give him to eat. And he's, he's upset. And he's obviously upset. He's just been taken from his parents. They know nothing about him other than that his name is Constantine and that he's four months old. Do they know they, where he's from? The contract workers don't know where he's from. Wow. When he gets to Michigan, his caseworker, all that she has in addition to that information is his birth certificate. So she knows she has his name. She has his parents' name. She knows he's from Romania. And she literally has to find his parents. So she goes to Facebook first, and she can't find them. So then she goes to the website of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. She has the dad's name and his date of birth. And with that, she's able to discover that he's in custody in Texas and then begins. I mean, it takes her 10 days to even get on the phone with his parents. And by then, you can imagine that both of them are pretty beside themselves, not having known where their baby was. Let's, um, what, so, sorry, but then what happens to baby Constantine? Up in Michigan, is it? In Michigan. Michigan. So Constantine gets stuck in the bureaucratic mess, which is the American immigration courts right now, which if you've read any of my stories, you will know <laughs> that we have a million backlog cases in the American immigration courts, and it takes a really long time to have your case heard. So he waited for five months in the US. It took him four months to get a court date. When he finally got to court, his uh, pro bono lawyers requested that he be sent back to Romania right away at US government expense. Uh, a DHS attorney argued, a Homeland Security Department attorney argued against that and said that Constantine was not eligible for that kind of relief. Uh, the judge got upset Crazy. and said, you know, basically, so you're you think that this, at the time, eight-month-old child should be able to make his way back to Romania on his own. That's not happening. You've got to send him <laughs> home. And, and finally, a month later, they sent the baby back. His dad was detained for four months in the US. So he, he was ultimately deported without Constantine. And he was actually told that he would get Constantine back if he agreed to his own deportation, like a lot of separated parents were. And all the way up <clears> until <throat> the point where he got onto the plane I mean, he, re he refused to get on the plane because he didn't have Constantine yet. And he says that he was told, go and take your seat. We'll bring you the baby. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So he went and took his seat. And they never brought on the baby. That's cruel, obviously. Um, you've reported on a lot of cruelties that have been done uh, to immigrant children and their parents. 
what is your, and, and you know, one of the suppositions that many people have made, which has been continually denied by DHS, is that this cruelty is intentional. It's a way of punishing. It's a way of sort of preventing further uh, asylum seekers, future asylum seekers from coming to the country. Is that, is that what you feel like your reporting has pointed to? <clears throat> I will say that what we have shown to be true in terms of the justification for family separation was to discourage people, was to create what they, they've used so many different phrases for it, but an outcome or a, an undesirable outcome or a penalty. Um, they don't use the word punishment, but, <clears throat> but they wanted to put something harsh in place that would discourage people from coming to the United States. That at this point has been acknowledged by Trump administration officials and in documents that have been leaked. I think that you know the gap between uh, tough penalty and cruelty is, is a significant one. Um, I think what's probably more uh, apt in this case and, and when we're talking about other uh, immigration policies of this administration is just a sort of a lack of planning, a lack mm -hmm. of process. Right, that's why the caseworker has to go on Facebook to find the Exactly, the father. Mm -hmm. and we saw something really similar when we reported on the travel ban as it was mm -hmm. rolled out. There was no plan, and so chaos ensued, and as a result, a lot of people end up getting hurt. So what happened to Constantine is that he ended up with a foster family. Right. And that is what our next clip, which is just about a minute and a half, shows is Constantine with his foster mother and father who are blurred out because their identities, uh, we're trying to conceal their identities. And then I think at the end of the clip, we see Constantine, or, or we don't see Constantine reunited with his mother, but we see his mother. So let's take a look at that and then we can talk about it. For security reasons, foster families are generally barred from talking to the media. Exactly we agreed not to reveal this family's identity so they could speak about Constantine. Different things go through your mind. You don't know what his personality will be like. Even four month old babies. You have to get to know him. That looks like an earlier picture, too. He doesn't have his curls yet. He, his hair got curly at some point? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think for me, every time Constantine would, you know, like he started sitting up or he started mm -hmm. to feed himself or, you know, when he started to really, like, interact, um, I would always think it breaks my heart that his mom is missing this moment. Atunci am făcut un șoc, am fost la spital. M-am înăcăjit, am plâns, am plâns până n-am mai putut să mai să rezist. Pe lumea dată, când am auzit că mi-are cineva grijă de copil, tu ca mamă să auzi că ți-are cineva grijă de copil, mai bine ai prefera să mor. So um, we are going to move to questions and just a few more of my questions, hmm. questions from all of you. But just so that we can give people a little bit of relief from the sadness of the story, can you tell them how it turns out? Constantine. Or should we home. not? Should we not give the spoiler? Don't Constantine the spoiler. is home. Constantine is home. Oh. I, yeah, he's back with his parents, and he's he's in Romania. He's from Romania. And he's getting used to life with them again. I mean, their life is very hard. And that's why they tried to come to the United States in the first place. And he also is struggling. But I think he's, you know, he can't tell me this, but he looks to be very happy to be back with his parents. And I know his family is very happy to be back with him. And his siblings are so loving and so happy to be back with him. I mean, they dote on him like you, you can't imagine. He's like the prince of the entire, not just their, their um, nuclear family, but their huge extended family that they live close to. Too. But you know, he'll be dealing with the repercussions of this for a really long time. He's almost two, and he still doesn't talk, and he can't walk on his own. Hmm. Um, I want to just ask a final kind of big picture question about the role of the weekly in our newsroom and, and, um, and also the daily, too, as a kind of precursor. Um, you know, one of the interesting stats about the daily is that there are, I believe, now more people who listen to the Daily on a on a weekday than who ever uh, read, you know, picked up a copy of the print New York Times during the peak of our 
print distribution when there was no internet. So in other words, all those decades when the New York Times was the main news source for so many people, it only you know, was reaching X number of folks on a, on, a, on a weekday, and we're now way beyond that just with the people that the Daily reaches, which really, I think, suggests that a younger generation that's getting most of their New York Times journalism through the Daily will come to see that as the New York Times. And I also wonder if the same may be true of a show like this which has the potential to reach even many more people when you think of the combined audiences of mm -hmm. FX and Hulu, they're, they're quite large. Um, how does that, this is a question initially for you, Sam, how does that idea that the New York Times, what the New York Times means to people, to <coughs> many, many millions of people, is now happening through uh, a podcast that's much more conversational and kind of casual than the front page ever used to be, or a show like this, which obviously has a lot of formalism to it as well, but still has a, a more kind of um, you know, casual and down-to-earth approach. Yeah. What does that mean for how the, the New York, what the New York Times means to people out there in the world? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a giant question, um, but I, I think it's quite exciting. And you remember, the, the mission of the New York Times isn't to publish a, a great newspaper, right? The mission of the New York Times is to help people understand the world. And when you think of it that way, things like the Daily reaching two million people a day, like that is exactly what the New York Times was put here on earth to do. And I very much hope that the Weekly reaches those, those same heights and is, has an audience on television that is understanding these big giant questions and thinking about them in a new way because of this TV show. We hope that someone will watch Sabrina's episode and want to read more about what's happening in Lordstown and follow her and see baby Constantine and want to come follow Caitlin Dickerson's reporting and that it becomes a bridge to the rest of the giant report that we do. So we're, we're trying to build that ecosystem. But even if somebody listens to the Daily every day or watches the Weekly every week, we feel like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And I would say it's, it's more conversational and casual, but it's not any less rigorous. Absolutely. Sabrina and mm -hmm. I can both speak to, you know, <laughs> recording daily episodes that you think are going to take 20 minutes and they take four hours. Right. So they're edited with the same yeah. maddening, but, <laughs> but excellent, nevertheless, level of rigor as our stories. All right. We have 10 minutes for questions from all of you. Yes. I am a little bit surprised that of the children who you have chosen to focus on is Constantine, a white child from a white country with all the migrant children who are Mexican and, and uh, 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 Central American, did it enter into the equation that this would be more persuasive to the, the perhaps the middle of the country to see this poor little white child taken away? Was that any part of the factor? Sorry, sorry. I'm going to try to okay. summarize your, your question. The question was, this is a a Baby Constantine episode is about a white child from a country that's predominantly white, uh, Romania. Um, and did it enter into the thinking at all in preparing for this episode, question for Caitlin, that the majority of the children who've been separated from their parents are from uh, Latin American countries, Central America, and was this a misrepresentation in any way? And, and, and did it enter into the thinking that a white child would somehow appeal more to certain viewers? Right, and so no, I mean, we chose to focus on Constantine in this story because he is the youngest child who was separated. I think that, like I pointed out too, it's Romanians have come, Roma people have come to seek asylum in the United States for a long time, and so that's not terribly surprising. I think the vast majority of people who were affected by family separation were Central American, and similarly, the vast majority of stories that we've written about family separation have centered on Central Americans. But in this case, Constantine both fit the, the profile of a, a typical asylum seeker and that he came from a persecuted ethnic minority and that he was the youngest child who was separated. And another important point, I mean, I don't know how much time you've spent in Europe, but he's by no means considered a white child in Europe. I mean, the Roma um, experience is, is very harrowing and, and discrimination is pretty flagrant. And just on that, you know, I'm one of the editors on the, on the show, and when Caitlin brought this idea, said, there's a four-month-old baby and I want to go find him, 
We said, yes, that's an episode of the weekly, absolutely. We knew nothing more, and we were quite surprised. I was, Caitlin wasn't as. I was quite surprised that it was a, a baby from Romania, and we asked a bunch of those questions. Huh, is that representative? Real life is messy. Journalism documents real life. Journalism is messy. The f that our immigration episode focuses on a Roma child during this is a surprise. But there's a, there's a serendipity to that that um, you can't strategically try and map. We're not trying to convince certain people. We're trying to tell a story about this moment in time. And I think Caitlin's is quite compelling. Do we have another question? Uh, we should use the microphone yeah, so everybody can hear. To, to walk, there, if you to can, come down and use Thanks. these microphones. It's just everybody can hear you so clearly. I don't want to try to repeat someone's question yeah. and get it wrong. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, this is wonderful. I've been reading the New York Times since I was 12, so thank you. <laughs> now, the question is, will these new formats penetrate parts of the country and demographic sections of the country that we need to penetrate? I mean, we get it here in New York. Yeah. We're talking about Trumpville, Trump land, and so forth. Will it penetrate the people who really need to hear this stuff, Mitch McConnell, and do something <laughs> about it? I'd like your thoughts, because we do believe in what's going on with you. When, when we um, decided to do this show, uh, a group of us, Jake and I and a couple of others, went to Los Angeles to, um, to find a partner in TV, somebody who wanted to take a chance. And we were really surprised. You, see, you notice that the show is on FX, a cable channel. We did not expect that it would be on FX. But we went to this meeting with the executives there, and they said, you guys probably think the show is going to end up on HBO or Netflix, which we did. And they said, you've already got those people. HBO people, they're already reading the New York Times. FX is a cable channel that's in 90 million homes. And the people who watch our shows are not reading the New York Times. They've never heard of The Daily. They don't know Michael Barbaro. They don't listen to podcasts. These are the people that a show like this needs to hit. And we found that argument really persuasive. So exactly to your point is why we made the show and why we chose FX as the partner for it. Yes, a question over here. I have three quick questions. <laughs> One is these are huge topics, and I wonder what sort of engagement you might build around them other than reading more, how the f show gets paid for, and what the relationship with Opdocs is. Very yeah. informed questions. Very indeed. <laughs> um, we're trying to do a lot around around each episode. So, Caitlin, various other reporters, doing ask me anything engagements on Reddit and doing daily episodes and doing email episodes and doing events and trying to create a conversation around each one of them. I think that's really important. Um, the show is paid for. Um, FX, our partner in TV, gave us a big. Budget. We wanted to make a high-end show where we could travel to Tajikistan and Nigeria and Mexico, where we have three crews in those countries right now. Um, and FX provided the, the money to do that. And, um, and Opdocs, um, it doesn't have much to do with it, other than we hope to be as good as Opdocs. That's the <laughs> video series that the opinion department runs. We have time for a few more questions. Yes. I'm not sure if this question is, is too goofy or too complex to answer mm, here, ooh. maybe both. But <laughs> Sabrina, I was, I was really wondering, I was very happy to see the way you, you did treat the CEO of, G, of GM with respect um, <coughs> and, 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 and you were very cordial to her. And the question I wondered that I, I didn't see answered was when you asked her why the plant, why the plant couldn't produce cars there that uh, were desirable, why everybody had to move. It, I mean, maybe it's just something silly, but I was dying to know the answer to that question. That's a great uh, question. So that's a question that Jake actually asked me just before we went on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the truth about Mary Barra is that she is a very, uh, um, she is a very smart and um, disciplined CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and we did um, a very, uh, you know, an interview with her uh, in which she doesn't really exactly, you know, just sort of level with you and answer your questions, but she is, you know, presenting a view, um, and and so it's a little bit hard to kind of get under the skin of it. I mean, I think the short answer is that the company is really trying to kind of just wrench itself into a new shape. And Lordstown, for many reasons, uh, you know, because it's this huge plant that was built in the 1960s, um, because of where it's located, uh, because it just didn't quite fit 
um, the strategic uh, kind of direction anymore, um, you know, didn't uh, didn't 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 make sense for them. Um, and you know, she that's not something that she she told me directly in the interview, but. Um, uh, I mean, it does feel, you know, one small wrinkle that, that we didn't really get into very much in the film is that there was a, uh, a news announcement, um, this is probably, I guess, middle of May, uh, that, that in, in, you know, it, it, was, it made a little bit of, made a blip because Trump started tweeting about it, but essentially um, a startup company, um, GM kind of made an announcement that a startup company uh, was going to buy the plant and was going to start making an electric truck there. But uh, then it turned out that the, the startup company um, didn't really have any revenue at all, and um, it was just it, it just wasn't it, it didn't seem to be a realistic uh, pers you know prospect for someone um, like Rick who was making you know twenty eight bucks an hour and uh, um, you know uh, you know it wasn't they weren't going to be union jobs so anyway so so. I'm probably going on too long on this uh, on this Mary Barra thing, but yeah, it's a good question, um, and it and it has a complicated answer. But the truth is, it just they just didn't it it was it wasn't going to happen. We have time for one last question, and you, sir, get the mm -hmm. honor of asking it. Um, I have a question about the development process of the whole thing. Um, why did you decide not to have a figure like Michael Barbaro? Because people identify so strongly with him, and now you're focusing just on the individual journalist. How did that happen? Everybody get that question? Why, why does, essentially, why does this show, The Weekly, not have a host? The way that The Daily has a host, Michael Barbaro, has become the face of The Daily. Um, uh, why didn't we use Michael or another, another person to host The Weekly? Yeah, that was the central question as we were developing it. And we assumed that we would have a host. And we tried a bunch of different people as hosts and a bunch of different ways to use a host. But it ended up feeling really wooden. We wanted, we didn't want to do a show with a man in a suit and an anchor, and you know, we took away the desk and then tried to be informal, and it felt just as stilted. You know, when Rukmini comes back from an interview with an ISIS militant leader in a Tajik prison, we wanted you to be there, and she knows her story best, and she can explain it to you. The idea of translating it through a host. Just we couldn't nail it. It just felt really old fashioned. It felt really kind of familiar. And when we removed that and handed the episode to the reporters who know it best, there's nobody you want to hear talk about child separation other than Caitlin. You don't need to launder that through through a host and, and on and on for every episode. For us, that's what really unlocked the show we wanted to tell, which is bringing viewers as close to the story as we could. And removing that host was kind of the, the key ingredient to do it. So Sunday night, 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Sorry, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> what is it?